Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Tonight is our last night together, and I just want to tell you, I want to say a special thank you. If you are one of the members here of the Edmund SDA Church, I want to give a special heartfelt thank you to you because you've hosted this seminar. I'm grateful for you coming out night by night. Can I just ask by a show of hands, how many of you have been with us every single night? Could I ask you to just raise your hand? We have some. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. And even if you couldn't be here every night, we're thankful that you made it to as many as you did. Now, our topic tonight, we're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And before we start, we want to pray. So please bow your heads with me as we begin. Heavenly Father, this evening, as we open the Bible together, we do pray that the Holy Spirit would be here. And we ask that you would help us to understand the role and function of spiritual gifts within the church. Be with us now this evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if anybody would recognize this picture on this. It's not a picture, but this wood cutting. Does anybody know who that is? Anybody know? That's Nostradamus, okay? Some people believe that he had insight into the the events of 9-11, as well as the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I'm not saying he did. We'll talk about that a little later. I'm sure you met, some of you will at least know who that is. Anybody know who that is? Benny Hinn. Now, if you, whether you knew it or not, Benny Hinn claims the gift of prophecy, and we'll see why, or I'll explain if that's so or not a little bit later. Ephesians 4 is where we want to begin in the Bible this evening, and here's what it says. Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, before we move on, if I asked you, what event does Ephesians 4, 8 describe? If you just look at Ephesians 4, verse 8, what does it, what event is this describing? You would say this describes the ascension of Jesus, right? Now, if you have a Bible like mine, when you read Ephesians 4, verse 8, right next to that word captivity, there's a little, like a little note, and then in the margin, it says he led a multitude of captives. Now, if you were with us on our night when we talked about death's mystery solved, and for those of you joining us by video, we discussed that when Jesus died, the day that he died, there was an earthquake, and the graves were open. Remember that? And then at the ascension of Jesus, or I should say at the resurrection of Jesus, bodies of the saints which were sleeping came out of the graves And they testify to the people in Jerusalem that Jesus was the resurrection and the life. But what happened to those people? Did they just live out the natural course of their life and go back and die again? No. Ephesians 4 verse 8 says that when Jesus ascended up on high, he led a multitude of captives. What does that mean? These people that had been held captive by the grave were now being led by Jesus as a fulfillment of the Jewish festival called the First Fruits. Paul refers to that in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, but the point is that this verse lets us know what happened to those people that were resurrected when Jesus was resurrected. Now, not only did Jesus lead this group of people, but the Bible says that he gave something. Now, notice that word gave. Did you notice I highlighted it? Because the very next verse is in parenthesis. Now, it's not in the original manuscript, but the, the, the translators of the Bible understood that this is kind of like a a parenthetical idea. So I'm going to just read verse 9 and 10, but don't forget that word gave. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascendeth up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now don't forget, verses 9 and 10 are in parenthesis, and then we come back to verse 11. Now 11 picks up where verse 8 left off, and it says, and he what? Now, remember, in verse 8, it says, when he ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. Do you remember that? But now in verse 11, what are those gifts? The Bible picks up this idea by saying, and he gave some, what gift? Apostles. And some, what else? Prophets. And some, what else? Evangelists. And some, what else? Pastors and teachers. So these are the gifts that were given When Jesus ascended up on high, we could call these the gifts of the Spirit. And what were these gifts for? Notice what Ephesians 4 verse 12 says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, do you realize that when the Bible speaks of the body of Christ, that's just another expression for the 
for the church, right? So the purpose of the gift of being apostle or prophets or evangelists or teachers or pastors, these gifts were to edify the Christian church. If that's clear, can you say amen? Now, not only that, the Bible says, until or till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What is that telling us? These gifts will be necessary right up until Jesus comes. How do I know that? Because it says, till we all come into the what? Unity of the faith. Now, folks, I want to tell you that even in single denominations, not all people in those denominations are agreed. Does that make sense? And so what the Bible is telling us is that this, these gifts are to edify and prepare the church until it, put, it presents a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Corinthians gives us a little longer list, but there's some overlap. Let's notice 1 Corinthians 12. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to how many? Every man to profit with all. So if I ask you, according to the Bible, how many people are given spiritual gifts? You would say, everybody. Now, just like in this room tonight, there could be someone that has some dormant gifts. Like maybe in this room, there's a Mozart sitting here. You know, maybe there's like a, you know, a Michelangelo. I don't know. It may be that they're here tonight, but if you don't exercise and use those gifts, you may never see the fulfillment of what it could be. Does that make sense? So while every person is given a spiritual gift, it doesn't mean that they've developed it to the extent that it could reach. Is that that clear? Now, verse 8 says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of what? Wisdom. To another the word of? knowledge by the same spirit. So here we have two different spiritual gifts. One's the word of wisdom. The other is the word of knowledge. I'll keep going. To another, what gift? Faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. We're going to come back to that. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit. Now look closely. Dividing to how many? Every man, how many? Severally as he will. Now, if I could ask you to look at that verse carefully, is it true that every person has some spiritual gifts? Is that true, yes or no? And is it also possible that every person has more than one spiritual gift? Is that possible? Yes. Was Paul, was he an apostle? Yes. Was he a prophet? Yes. Was he a teacher? Yeah. So you get the point, right? Some of, and by the way, Paul even said in 1 Corinthians 14 that he speaks in tongues as well, right? So Paul had multiple spiritual gifts. I want you to know that the Bible gives us quite a long list in 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to just point out a few here. Wisdom is that rare gift that doesn't necessarily depend on education. I have a friend whose father never graduated from high school. Back in those days, they couldn't understand learning disorders. And they thought, if you can't read, then you're dumb. Well, turns out he just had dyslexia. But he, you know, the system failed him. But over the years, he cobbled a living together and was able to put his children through school. And when I met him, I discovered that here was someone, may not have a lot of education in the worldly sense, But his life experiences gave him that rare gift that we would call wisdom. I've met people like that. And not everybody that has a hard life has wisdom either, okay? But this is one experience uh, with a person that I met that definitely had the gift. Now, in college, I had some of my friends. I had one friend in particular that didn't study. I won't tell you his name, but he came from a wealthy home. He never studied. Like, he was always on his computer, calling his girlfriend, playing guitar. They're just doing everything else but studying. And when it came time for testing, amazingly, he always passed with flying colors, like A's, high B's, you know, always. It was always like that. And I studied. I'm not, I wasn't the perfect student, but, but even though I studied a lot, I was always in the middle, like C's, you know, sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that he was one of those people, and this is, this is, exactly how he was. He could read it once and never have to go back and look at it again. And if he heard it once, like he could hear an entire sermon 
and he could recite it without ever going over it again. Now, there were people like that. Now, I want to tell you something. There was a point when I thought, man, like how lucky can a person be? But it turns out that even though he had this amazing gift of being able to accumulate and store up lots of knowledge, he made some really poor choices in his life, okay? And knowledge and wisdom are not the same thing, if that's clear. Can you say amen? Okay, all right. So I wanna talk to you about the gift of healing. Now, my sister is a physician and she worked for many years at a private uh, religious um, hospital organization. And she told me there were cases that she saw that defied human explanation. Okay, there are, even in modern 2018, there are still things that baffle medical science. But I'm going to tell you a story of a friend of mine that is also quite intriguing. I used to teach at a college, and while I taught there, we had a new staff member that came from Australia. And... Nobody really knew much about her, but she came, she worked hard, uh, she got accepted into a salaried position. And when the school season was off, so like winter breaks and then spring and summer breaks, she always was traveling around the United States. Now, we didn't know until later that even when she arrived, she had been diagnosed with an aggressive brain tumor. It was by her ear, she claimed. Now, I'm not trying to make anybody paranoid, but she claimed that through excessive cell phone usage. Like, <laughs> but anyway, the point is, yeah, I, I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, so, sh- so, she, so she was traveling around the country trying to find a place that would actually treat her. Because where she was from, Australia, they wouldn't treat her. Like they said, the location of it and such, we are unwilling. So she began traveling around and she started looking into alternative like treatment centers. So the the major hospitals, they wouldn't. And by the way, it wasn't an imaginary thing. She had the x-rays to prove that she had it. One break, she came back and it was gone. And it wasn't gone because of some kind of surgery. She had experienced miraculous healing. And I can't tell you everything that she did, but I do know this. There is a special gift that is from the spirit that is a manifestation of this particular gift that the Bible describes. It's a separate and distinct thing. I think that there are physicians that definitely have, you know, a gift in that regards. But what we're talking about is more akin to what we might call today like a miracle. Are you with me? Okay. All right. So if I asked you on this list, which gift has received the most attention in the Christian church today? Now look carefully. Which gift would you say has probably received more interest than any of the others? You would say it's the gift of tongues, okay? Now, I want you to know that there was a specific reason why this gift was given. This is Mark 16, verse 15. Jesus said to his disciples, and he said unto them, go ye into where? All the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, if you remember... When you read the book of Acts, you'll discover that the disciples were largely from one area. They were largely from Galilee, okay? And so when the Bible says that they were to go into all the world, Jesus wasn't speaking this figuratively. He meant this quite literally. But they were faced with a serious problem. And that problem was, how would they preach the gospel when they reached China or India And I don't know if you know this, but scholars say that Thomas, the disciple Thomas, he died in India. And there's evidence that Christianity had reached, you know, some of these other countries as the result of the disciples doing what Jesus said. So then the question is, how would they do it? Well, here's what Jesus promised. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with what? New tongues. Now, I want to let you know that in the, in the, in the Bible, that expression tongues, as, and especially in the New Testament, it simply refers to language. So when it says new tongues, it simply means that they shall speak with new what? Languages. Does that make sense? Now, why would they need this? Because they needed to go into all the world and do what? 
to preach the gospel, right? And so they'd, they'd have to be able, you know, they didn't have like these fancy programs like we have on our phones today. They didn't have any of that. So they had to be able to communicate. So here's what that gift looked like. This is on the day of Pentecost. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Now remember, what that, that word tongues, it's synonymous with languages, right? As the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Now, please look closely. Because that every man heard them speak in his own what? Language. Now, please tell me, when the disciples spoke in tongues, did the listeners understand what they were saying, yes or no? Yeah. Yes, the Bible didn't say that they were speaking these unintelligible ecstatic utterances. It says that every man heard him speak in his own language. But let's keep noticing how this worked. And they were all amazed and marveled and saying one to another, behold, not, are not all these which speak Galileans? How then and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Now notice how many different groups of people there were. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. Now notice, please look closely. We do hear them speak in our what? Tongues. What's another synonym for that? Language. The wonderful works of God. Friends, it's unequivocal. It's, it's very clear. When the disciples spoke in tongues, the people that were listening understood what they were saying. If that's clear, can you say amen? Now, why is that important? Because friends, when we look today in the Christian world, the gift of tongues as it's being described in the modern Christian world does not resemble the biblical description of the gift of tongues. Now let's review, why was it given? It was given to preach the gospel. But today, when we hear people speaking in tongues, not only do the listeners not understand what is being said, but very often the person who is speaking in tongues doesn't even understand what they're saying. Now, I know that some of you might be perplexed. Well, then why is it so popular? Why is there such an emphasis on this need to manifest this particular spiritual gift? Well, just so that you know, the Bible teaches that one evidence that we have salvation or one evidence we have eternal life is that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's called the earnest of our inheritance. It's like a down payment that you're going to buy a house. Does that make sense? And so if you have the Holy Spirit, it means you have eternal life. If that's clear, can you say amen? But what's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit? How do you know you have it? Well, folks, today a lot of people like the idea that if I have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, one of which is the gift of tongues, then that must mean that I have the Holy Spirit and as it would follow then that I have eternal life. Does that make sense? The problem is that Christianity today kind of gives this formula. Like you kind of do what you want and then you come to church and you speak in tongues and that's the manifestation that you know, you've been saved. The Bible is clear about the relationship between the Holy Spirit and his people. Here's what it says. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that what? Obey him. Now, does it make sense that it's not that we do whatever we want and then we come to church and we speak in tongues and that means that we're saved? No, it's that we live the way that Jesus wants us to live by him indwelling in us. And then we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Does that make sense? So, Please don't miss the relationship here. Now, I'm going to shift gears here. I'm going to talk about the gift of prophecy tonight, and I want to talk with you about the early Christian church and what it looked like. The Bible says, now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain what? Prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Now, I'm reading these verses to you because I want you to understand that what we're looking at is we see that in the early Christian church, they had the active gift of prophecy, meaning they had people 
who were real, genuine prophets. If that's clear, can you say amen? And I'm going to show you that it wasn't just isolated to these places. Notice Acts 21. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed. And we came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, meaning the seven deacons, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did what? So here we see, even in Caesarea, and, and did you notice something? Philip was one of the seven deacons, and he was an evangelist. He had this gift. But did you notice that he wasn't the prophet? It was his four daughters that had the gift of prophecy. Did you notice that? So one of the first things you should notice in the early Christian church, the gift of prophecy was not isolated to like one person or exclusive to one person or isolated to one church, but rather it was widespread, and there were men and women prophet and prophetesses. Does that make sense? So that's an important distinction for us to notice. So some of you might be sitting here tonight and you might be thinking, okay, why don't we see a lot of prophets around in churches today? So there's something that you have to know. And this is an expression that is not uncommon in the Bible. When you read the Bible, you will discover that there is a phrase and that phrase is the law and the Prophets. Have you ever heard that? The law and the prophets, law and the prophets, law and the prophets. Now, there's a reason why they go together. Because God's law, the Ten Commandments, is the expression of his will. And when the people of God began to depart from that, God would send them messengers. And those messengers would say, hey, you're, you're going into the path of disobedience. Come back to the path of obedience. And so the prophet's function was to point people back to the obedience of God's law. Does that make sense? We often think of a prophet as someone who predicts the future. That's actually not, they might have done that, but that's not really what they were for. A prophet is literally a mouthpiece for God. Does that make sense? So notice this in Lamentations 2 verse 9. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He hath destroyed and broken her bars. Her kings and her princes are among the Gentiles. Now notice what it says here. The law is what? No more. Her prophets also find no what? Vision from the Lord. Now, let me see if I can explain this. The purpose of the prophets was to point people back to the obedience of God's law. But when the people really rejected the law, I mean like not just departing, but they said, okay, we're not going to obey God at all. God removed the gift of prophecy. Why? Because he knew that in that state, when the prophet was sent to give his message, for sure, it would have been a short death sentence because they were in such a rebellious state that there was no hope of retrieving or bringing the people back. Now, this relationship between the law and the prophets can be seen in multiple places. Jeremiah 26 says, And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If you will not hearken unto me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not hearkened. Then will I make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Now, did you notice that God had told his people, look, you've rejected my law and you don't listen to my prophets. So again, the purpose of the prophets was to point people back to the obedience of God's law. When they rejected his law, God removed that gift. Here's Ezekiel chapter 7 and verse 26. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then they shall seek a what? A vision of the prophet. Now, I just want to remind you that God spoke to prophets through visions and dreams. That was his means of communicating to them. But it says the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. Now, what does that mean? When the people rejected the law, God no longer gave counsel or wisdom or visions to his prophets. Why? Because the people were too far gone. Now, I'm going to read a verse to you that you might hear around this time of the year. If you go to a graduation, and let's say there's a Christian influence in the particular school setting that you're in, you might hear a preacher read this verse, okay? Proverbs 29, 18. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, I want to make a point here. When you hear a graduation speaker get up and say, young people, you need to have a goal in your life. You need to have a vision. And then they read Proverbs 29, 18. Now, 
that is a good thing to have in life. I want to agree that it's good to have a goal in life. Amen? That's a good thing. But Proverbs 29, 18 is not talking about that at all. It has nothing to do with that. And let me explain why. Proverbs 29 is part of Proverbs, which is a book of poetry. Does that make sense? And poetry in Hebrew, it mirrored ideas. And it didn't always like have the same idea. Sometimes it was a contrast. This is an example of that. Let me explain how it goes. So where there is no vision, let's review. Why does God not give prophets vision? Why? Because they rejected his law. Are you with me? So let's review what we've learned. The prophet's function was to point people back to the obedience of God's law. But when the people completely rejected the law, God removed visions and dreams from the prophets. Why? because he didn't want them to get killed. Does that make sense? So he removes that gift because the people are in a complete state of rebellion. So when the Bible says where there is no vision, that implies that God has removed the gift of prophecy for the reason that the people have what? Rejected the law. Does that make sense? Then the, the, the second stanza says, but he that keepeth the law happy is he. Can you see the contrasting ideas in this verse? Look, it's good to have a goal. I hope I didn't deflate anyone's, you know, ideas about this verse. But the true meaning of this is dealing with the gift of prophecy and the conditions under which it's given. Now, the Bible says that in the last days, God will have a special people. Here's what it says. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So in the last days, there will be a commandment keeping people. So then the question is, will there be real active prophets again in the last days? Well, I want to read to you from the Old Testament, Joel chapter two, look at verse 28. Here's what the Bible says. And it shall come to pass when? Afterwards. So we gotta, we're going to find out when that time period is because right there, it just kind of seems like nebulous. When is this after what? that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall what? Prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Now, before I move on, can you please tell me, are the gifts of the spirit, especially the gift of prophecy, are they limited by gender, yes or no? No, it says your sons and your daughters. Now, here's another question. Is it limited by age? No, did you notice that it said your young men and then it also said your old men, right? And then notice the next verse. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour up my spirit. Is it limited by socioeconomic distinctions or class? No, right? Did you notice that? Okay, then verse 30 says, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood Now, when is this all happening? When? Before the great and what? Terrible day of the Lord come. Now, please tell me, was the first coming the great and terrible day or is that the second coming? Which one, first or second? That's the second coming. Now, don't miss what we're reading about. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord, God is gonna pour out his what? His spirit and your young men and your old men, your sons and your daughters, the servants and the handmaids, will prophesy. Are you with me? So before the second coming, the Bible predicts a rekindling of the gift of prophecy. Now here's Amos chapter three. Look at verse seven. The Bible says, surely the Lord God will do how much? Nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the what? Now I want to be clear. When the Bible says this, it's talking about in every major event in salvific history, God has always given foreknowledge of that event to his people through prophets. I'm going to give you some examples in the Bible so that this will be a little bit easier to understand. If you read Genesis 15, Abraham had a vision where God said, Abraham, your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs for 400 years. Well, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One was named Joseph. Joseph went to Egypt, he brought all his brothers, and sure enough, the prophecy began. But when, as the centuries passed by, 
God didn't expect that everybody was like, oh, it's, it's just about that time. It's time to, no. He knew that they might forget. And so when the time was about to arrive, that it was time to leave, God didn't just expect that they would remember. Remember, God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And so he raised up another prophet to say, hey, it's time to go. It's time for us to leave here. And that prophet's name was Moses. Does that make sense? So don't miss the point here. God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Here's another example. When we see in Genesis 49, Jacob was dying. Under inspiration, he gave a blessing to all of his 12 sons. But as he gave that blessing, he prophesied, he predicted what would befall them in the future. And to his son Judah, he said that the scepter would not depart from Judah, which means the kingship, until Shiloh, which means the peace giver, comes. What, we, what he was saying was the tribe of Judah would maintain civil power all the way up until the time that the Messiah would arrive. Now, that was predicted by Jacob, and that was true because the kingdom split after Solomon, and it split into two. There was the northern ten and then the southern two. And so Judah, it had civil power. Long story short, the Romans came and they subjugated it. But even when they subjugated it, the, the Jews still had civil power. And then, of course, their power was getting smaller and smaller, and then suddenly God reminded his people, hey, the, he didn't expect them to remember, but he raised up another messenger to say, hey, the Lamb of God is here. And that prophet's name was John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist said, hey, behold the Lamb of God, right? Now, here's another example. This is easy. Jeremiah. If you read Jeremiah, he predicted that because of God's people's rebellion, they would be taken captive by the Babylonians for 70 years, right? Well, guess what? Jeremiah predicted it, and God doesn't do anything unless he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And after those 70 years were expired, God raised up two men to say, hey, it's time for us to go back and rebuild the city and the temple. And those two men were Ezra and Nehemiah, right? Now, we studied in our seminar Daniel's prophecy about the 2300 days, and we learned that Daniel saw that after 2300 years, the final judgment in heaven would begin. Are you with me? Now, we learned that that final judgment began, do you remember the date in the year? 1844. You remember that? So the question is, did God just expect that everyone would remember? Or he doesn't do anything unless he reveals his secret unto his servants, the, the prophets, right? Okay, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 6, even as the testimony of... Christ was confirmed in you. Now, don't, don't miss the context. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, hey, you guys had the genuine testimony of Christ. Well, what is the testimony of Christ? Now, remember, we saw this uh, the other night. The testimony of Jesus is the gift or the spirit of prophecy. So the church at Corinth, they also had the gift of prophecy, but I'm going to read the next verse. Paul says, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's my question. For people that are waiting for the coming of Jesus, do they need all the spiritual gifts, yes or no? Do they? Yeah. Paul says here, for you who are waiting for the coming of Jesus, I don't, you guys had that gift of prophecy, and I'm glad because I don't want you to come behind in any gift waiting for Jesus to come. All right. Now, Matthew 24, and just in case you've forgotten, what we're trying to answer is, can we expect to see the gift of prophecy one more time before Jesus comes. Matthew 24, verse 24. Now, many of you, if you've been with us from the beginning, you know Matthew 24 describes the destruction of Jerusalem and the events right before the second coming. And here's what Jesus predicted. For there shall arise false Christs, and what else? False prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, I'm gonna ask you a simple question. Now, this is an older one. I should take a picture of a new one, but... This here, is this real or is it fake? These are really high definition projectors, by the way. So, but, okay, I'll just tell you, it's real, okay? But how about this? Is this real or is it fake? Ah, so this is where some of you hesitated. And let me explain why you hesitated. See, everybody knows that there is such a thing as a real $100 bill, right? Now, don't miss this point. Because there is such a thing, 
that's why there can be a counterfeit $100 bill. Does that make sense? But when you saw this one, the problem is you're not sure if there is such a thing as a $1,000 bill. Because I know if some of you are walking in the parking lot of Walmart and you picked up a $7 bill, you're not going to try to spend it, right? <laughs> okay, but this is true. This is real. There were $1,000 bills in circulation up until about 1998, and then they got pulled out of circulation. But don't miss the point that I'm trying to make. A counterfeit can only exist if there's a real one. Does that make sense? Now, you know why I'm telling you that? Because Jesus said, before I come, there's going to be false Christs and what else? False prophets. You know what he could have said? He could have said, hey, if anybody claims to be a prophet, don't believe them because there won't be any anymore, right? But that's not what Jesus said. He said, beware because there will be what? False prophets. There would only be false prophets if there would also be what? Real ones. Does that make sense? So how do you know if someone's a real prophet? Well, that's tricky. Let me show you what the Bible says. The Bible says, quench not the spirit, despise not what? I'm going to be honest. Like, I'm of a more skeptical nature. And so, like, if I hear someone that says, hey, I'm a prophet, almost without fail, I'm automatically like, no, probably not, you know? But, you know, that's just me. But the Bible is clear. It says, despise not what? But then it says in the very next verse, it says to do what? Prove all things. So there must be some way that you can prove to see if someone has the genuine gift of prophecy. So we come to 1 John 4, and I want to read this to you. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many, what? False prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is what? Is of God. Now, did you notice what the Bible said? Now, please notice this. This is very important. The Bible says that in the last days, there would be many false prophets. And then the Bible says, this is how you know. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So I'm going to give you a little idea. First John was written towards the end of John's life, sometime 90, 100 AD. Now, at that point, Christianity had been already flourishing, But as it flourished, errors began to creep into the Christian church. And there was a specific heresy that John was addressing here. And that heresy was called docetism. And in a nutshell, docetism said that Jesus was God, but that he never was really a man. Now, I don't know if you understand the ramifications of what that would mean. Because yes, Jesus is God, but Jesus was also fully man as well. Because if Jesus wasn't fully man, Can God die, yes or no? No, and if God didn't die, that means Jesus didn't die. If he was only God, that means that we're still in our sins. That means that Jesus didn't save us. Does that make sense? So what Paul is, I'm sorry, what John is saying here is very simple. He's saying, here's one way that you can know if someone is truly a true or false prophet, and that is that they will always uphold Jesus as the hope of salvation. If that's clear, can you say amen? So a true prophet will always uphold Jesus as the hope of salvation. And I want to make a point. Just by that token, Nostradamus is not a true prophet. Now, some of you might be thinking, you know, but couldn't other people, folks, if you're not connected to God, only God knows the future, okay? Isaiah is clear that only God knows the future, which means the devil doesn't know. He can guess, but he doesn't know. Does that make sense? Which means that if someone is not connected to God, if they're not beholding Jesus as the hope of salvation, then they're just guessing. Does that make sense? Okay, point number two, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is what? No light in them. Now, what is the law and the testimony? That just means the Bible. Does that make sense? So folks, I want to be clear. If a person has the genuine gift of prophecy, they will not contradict what the Bible says. Does that make sense? Because the Bible says if they they speak not according to this, it is because there is what? No light in them. So a true prophet not only upholds Jesus as the hope of salvation, but he will always or she will always be in harmony with the Bible. Now look closely at this one, Jeremiah 28, verse 9. The prophet which prophesieth of peace. 
When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Now, what does this mean? If a person claims to, be the, to have the genuine gift of prophecy, not only will they uphold Jesus as the hope of salvation, and not only will they always be in harmony with the word of God, but if they make a prediction, it has to come true. Does that make sense? And it's not like, oh, 60% or 51%. No, it has to be 100%. Does that make sense? Now, <clears throat> I want to make one side point here. A true prophet will not waste their time predicting who's going to win you know, the NBA Finals or the World Series or the F Super Bowl. Like, does it make sense? I just want to point something out to you because, like, there are, there's this idea that if you can predict, you know, but anyway. So, a true prophet, a true prophet, if they make a prediction, it's got to be accurate 100% of the time. I'm going to tell you a story. In the Bible, there was a, a person who claimed to be a prophet, and God said, look, I want you to go to the city, and I want you to tell them that in 40 days, I'm going to wipe them out. So this person went to the city, and he started walking up and down the city and saying, God's given you 40 days, and I'm going to destroy the city. And I'm sure at first people thought he was a lunatic, you know, but he kept walking around. And, you know, at some point, people thought, hey, maybe this guy has something to his story. You know, maybe, maybe God's going to do something, and we are pretty bad. So the Bible says that everybody from the king down repented. And you know what happened at the end of 40 days? Nothing. By the way, what story am I talking about? Jonah. Now, here's my question. Now, I want you to look at that screen, and I want you to tell me this. Did Jonah possess the genuine gift of prophecy, yes or no? Now, don't miss what we just read. If a prophet makes a prediction, it will be known that the Lord has sent him if it comes to pass, right? Did Jonah make a prediction? Did it come to pass? No. Is he a true prophet? Yes. So what's the reason? What's the reason? Let me explain the reason. Some prophecies are conditional in nature, which means if the people repent, God will avert the intended judgment. Does that make sense? Can you say hallelujah? <laughs> because that means that God is merciful. Amen. But don't miss the point. There are some prophecies that have a conditional element. If people respond, God doesn't have to, you know, send the judgment or do whatever he was intending to do. Does that make sense? So a true prophet, if they make an unconditional prophecy, the record has to be 100%. Are we clear? Okay, here's the last one. Beware of what? False prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? So even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and is cast into the fire. Now finally, verse 20, wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now, I didn't show this to you, but verse 15 of Matthew 7 is like a new paragraph. And that was the topic sentence. The topic sentence was, beware of false prophets. And then the conclusion of that paragraph is verse 20. By their what? Fruits. Now, let's review. What is a prophet? What's the function of a prophet? A mouthpiece. Yeah, point people back to obedience of God's law, right? Let's say that you had someone that claimed to be a prophet, and you got to know them. And next thing you know, you find out they've got a gambling addiction. They're cheating on their spouse. And, you know, they're not paying their taxes. I mean, when you see all those things, you automatically know they cannot be a genuine what? Why? Because by their fruits you shall know them does that make sense okay so here are the biblical tests of a prophet and it's not just one you have to have all of them does that make sense they have to uphold jesus as the hope of salvation they have to be in harmony with the bible if they contradict it automatically you know it's not true they if they make a prediction and it's unconditional in nature it's got to be accurate 100 percent of the time and by their life you have to definitely see that they're in harmony with god's word so my question tonight is this is there anybody after the Christian dispensation, after the time of Jesus and the disciples, that possessed the genuine gift of prophecy. Well, I'm going to give you a little history. Back in the middle part of the 19th century, there was a revival that broke out around the world. In America, it was called the Millerite Movement. And people began to, in earnest, study the books of Daniel and Revelation, and they began to believe and, and, and anticipate the soon return of Christ. 
Well, the problem was that they set a date. And when they set the date and the date came and it passed, basically thousands of people dwindled, well, like whittled, got whittled down to maybe like 50. And among the believers that were left, they were praying and there was a young girl. Her name was Ellen Harmon. She was 17 years old and she received a vision. Now, Ellen Harmon's first vision was to give the believers an understanding of what was then called the midnight cry, okay? Now, she later married someone by the name of James White, and she became known as Ellen G. White. So who is this woman, Ellen G. White? Well, she was a twin. She had a sister named Elizabeth, but they were identical twins. Now, there's not much in the life of Ellen White, uh, just as far as from her childhood, except when she was in third grade. When she was walking home from school one day, a, ch a classmate called out her name, and just as Ellen turned, she threw a rock that hit her face. Now, medical science back then was not what it is today, and she barely recovered from that. She, find she, couldn't, she couldn't go back to school, but staying at home, she was a voracious reader, and she read and read and read, and one of the books she loved to read was the Bible, and she had a Early on in her childhood, she had a genuine experience with Jesus. Later on, she went on to marry a man by the name of James White. They had four sons. But the question tonight is, does this woman, Ellen White, meet the biblical tests of a prophet? Well, the first one that we reviewed is that a true prophet always upholds Jesus as the hope of salvation. Here's what she said in one of her books, Gospel Workers. Lift up Jesus, you that teach the people. Lift him up in sermon, in song, in prayer. Let all your powers be directed in pointing souls, confused, bewildered, and lost to the Lamb of God. Another test that we looked at is that a true prophet will always be in harmony with God's word. This is from her famous book, The Great Controversy. She writes, true Christianity receives the word of God as the great treasure house of inspired truth and the test of all inspiration. In that same book, she said, the Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the test of experience. Now, if a prophet is true, not only do they uphold Jesus as the hope of salvation, not only are they in harmony with the Bible, but if they make a prediction, it has to come true. Here's what she said in 1864, okay, 1864. She wrote, tobacco is a poison of the most deceitful and malignant kind. It is all the more dangerous because its effects upon the system are so slow and scarcely perceivable. Now, some of you are sitting here right now and saying, that's not a prediction. I mean, everybody knows that. If you could go back in a time machine to this date, if you could go back even a little bit earlier, you would be shocked to discover that if you had like a, <clears throat> like a cough and you went to the doctor, this is true, I study this in school, they actually prescribed cigar smoking for lung ailments. No, I'm saying because cigarettes, like mass manufactured cigarettes hadn't been quite perfected at that point. So like they were still smoking cigars and they actually believed back then that smoking was good for you. In fact, in fact, in, in her time, they sponsored a race between a smoker and a non-smoker. The smoking company sponsored this, okay? Guess who won? No, the non-smoker. Come on, guys. <laughs> but, but don't miss the point. They, medical science back then, they were way behind. People weren't saying this back then. Are you with me? So in other words, she was predicting, and she was, even without the medical science to back it up, she was saying, look, this is a poison. It wasn't until almost 100 years later that the a American Heart Association said, this causes lung cancer, okay? She also said, people are continually eating flesh that is filled with tuberculosis and cancerous germs. Tuberculosis, cancer, and other fatal diseases are thus communicated. Now, You'll be surprised that she describes this expression, cancerous germs. Now, part of the reason is because when she wrote these, the, this statement, the term virus, it wasn't in existence at that time. But here's what later research proved. Dr. Wendell Stanley, University of California virologist and Nobel Prize winner, went so far as to state, without qualification, that he believes 
that viruses cause most of all human cancer. Now, if you're not sure of that, I want you to think, right now there's a big push from the pharmaceutical industry to protect young women against cervical cancer. Isn't that right? How are they proposing to do that? By vaccination. By vaccination, right? So don't miss that. They're vaccinating people against cancer, right? Okay. Now, uh, in 1902, Ellen White warned that San Francisco and Oakland would be visited by the Lord because they were becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. It was just six, four years later, 1906, that there was, she was living in Australia by that point. But when the news finally reached her, she wept because of the loss of life and the destruction. Now, did she live a fruitful life? Paul Harvey, I don't know if you miss, you know, the, the Paul Harvey radio broadcast. Her writings, this is Paul Harvey speaking, have been translated into 148 languages, more than Karl Marx or Leo Tolstoy, more than Agatha Christie, more than Shakespeare. You know, I realize Shakespeare is only good in English. You can't translate it. But anyway, only now is the world coming to appreciate her recommended prescription for optimum spiritual and physical health. Then he says, Ellen White, you don't know her? What does he say? Get to know her. This is George Wharton James, another author. He said, this remarkable woman, though almost entirely self-educated, has written and published more books in more languages, which circulate to greater extent than any other woman in history. Now, someone went to the Library of Congress, and they asked one of the librarians there. Now, they couldn't use their name because, obviously, that would look like an official endorsement. But they just asked this question. They said, hey, what's the best book on the life of Jesus after the Bible? And this is how he responded. My preference or choice would be guided by what I wish to get from the book or books to be read. But let me put it this way. I would put the desire of ages by Ellen G. White first for spiritual discernment and practical application. Ellen White had a great deal of emphasis on education, Christian education. And as a result of her writings, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has the second largest parochial school system in the world. She also had a great deal of emphasis on healthy living. And as a result of that, the Seventh-day Adventist Church boasts one of the finest healthcare systems in the world, okay? My sister happens, happens to work for them for many, many years. And they've pioneered a number of very, very uh, significant achievements in medicine. Um, she died in 1915. She died in 1915, and when she died, this is what the paper had to say about it. She showed no spiritual pride, and she sought no filthy lucre. By the way, some prophets, some so-called prophets, are in it for profit. Are you with me? But not her. She lived the life and did the work of a worthy prophetess, the most admirable of the American succession. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 20:20, 20, 20, it says, Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Tonight, I want to ask you to look at this delicious apple pie. I don't know if you like apple pie. If I had a choice between cake or pie, I would choose pie, okay? <laughs> but have you ever had, you know, a fresh pie out of the oven? It's, the, the crust is like warm and it's flaky and like the juices from the apples is just flowing out. And let's say that I'm eating it in front of you. Let's say there's even some ice cream on it and I'm eating it in front of you. And, you know, by now, hopefully your mouth is watering. But anyway, so I'm eating this and I'm saying, man, this is just amazing. You've got, it. You've got to try this. Does it make sense that you would never know how tasty that pie is until you try it for yourself? Tonight as you leave, I'm going to share with you one of my favorite books by Ellen White. It's called Steps to Christ. It's a small book, but I got to tell you, I've read this book, I don't know, probably seven or eight times through from cover to cover. But let me tell you something. Seventh-day Adventists do not view Ellen White as a replacement for the Bible. I want to be very clear. We view her writings as simply like a commentary on the Bible. But if you've noticed in our seminar, everything that we've taught comes from the Bible. That's the rule of faith. But you know what? Sometimes it helps to have another perspective on it, and that's where she comes in. And I want to tell you, during World War II, they gave this to soldiers. Because really, when you are facing life and death, there's something about knowing Jesus 
that helps people gain a perspective on what's really important. Does that make sense? And look, again, if you go through these pages, you will see it's replete with scripture because she is using the Bible and is upholding the Bible. As you leave tonight, this is my gift for you. I wanna thank you for joining us in the seminar. Tomorrow morning, we have our class with Pastor TJ. It's a continuation, it's at 9.30, it's interactive question and answer. And during our divine service, our, our host pastor will be preaching and we have some baptisms tomorrow as well. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So folks, we've got a full Sabbath. I hope that you'll plan to be with us. If you're watching by video, it's a great opportunity for you to join us on this Sabbath as well. As we close tonight, please bow your heads with me as we have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this evening, we are thankful for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're thankful because every one of us has been given a gift by which we can upbuild and edify your church and your kingdom. And I pray that as we look and see the wonderful resources that are available to us, May we avail ourselves of them so that we come behind in no gift waiting for the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, we've come into the sunset hours of Friday. I wanna wish you a happy Sabbath and by God's grace, I'll see you tomorrow morning. God bless you and have a good evening.